Thabo Mbiki. Thabo Mvielwa Mbiki Kosa pronunciation. Thabo Mbiki, born 18 June 1942, is a South African politician who served as the second president of South Africa from 16 June 1999 to 24 September 2008. On 20 September 2008, with about nine months left in his second term, Mbiki announced his resignation after being recalled by the National Executive Committee of the ANC, following a conclusion by Judge C.R. Nishalson of improper interference in the National Prosecuting Authority NPA, including the prosecution of Jacob Zuma for corruption. On 12 January 2009, the Supreme Court of Appeal unanimously overturned Judge Nishalson's judgment, but the resignation stood. During his tenure in office, the South African economy grew at an average rate of 4.5% per year, creating employment in the middle sectors of the economy. The black middle class was significantly expanded with the implementation of Black Economic Empowerment BE. This growth increased the demand for trained professionals whose numbers were strained by emigration due to violent crime, but failed to address unemployment amongst the unskilled bulk of the population. He attracted the bulk of Africa's foreign direct investment FDI and made South Africa the focal point of African growth. He was the architect of NEPED, whose aim is to develop an integrated socio-economic development framework for Africa. He also oversaw the successful building of economic bridges to BRIC Brazil, Russia, India and China nations with the eventual formation of the India-Brazil-South Africa IBSA Dialogue Forum to further political consultation and coordination as well as strengthening sectoral cooperation and economic relations. Mbiki mediated in issues on the African continent including Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo DRC, Ivory Coast, and some important peace agreements. Mbiki oversaw the transition from the Organization of African Unity OAU to the African Union O. His quiet diplomacy in Zimbabwe, however, is blamed for protracting the survival of Robert Mugabe's regime at the cost of thousands of lives and intense economic pressure on Zimbabwe's neighbors. He became a vocal leader of the non-aligned movement in the United Nations, and while leveraging South Africa's seat on the Security Council, he agitated for reform of that body. Mbiki has received worldwide criticism for his stance on AIDS. He questions the link between HIV and AIDS, and believes that the correlation between poverty and the AIDS rate in Africa was a challenge to the viral theory of AIDS. His fate was not helped by Health Minister Manto Tshavalala Msemang, the overhaul of the pharmaceutical industry in South Africa. His ban of antiretroviral drugs in public hospitals is estimated to be responsible for the premature deaths of between 330,000 and 365,000 people. Early Life and Education Born and raised in Mbiwulani, Eastern Cape Province, South Africa, Mbiki is one of four children of Epanet and Gavin Mbiki. He is also the grandson of Chief Thabo Mbiki. The economist Moletsi Mbiki is one of his brothers. His father was a stalwart of the African National Congress ANC and the South African Communist Party. He is a native Kosa speaker and his father Gavan named him Thabo after his old close friend Thabo Mafatsanyana. His parents were both teachers and activists in a rural area of strength to the African National Congress and Mbiki describes himself as born into the struggle. A portrait of Karl Marx sat on the family mantelpiece, and a portrait of Mohandas Gandhi was on the wall. Mbiki attended primary school in Idutua and Butterworth, and acquired a secondary education at Lovedale, Alice. In 1959, he was expelled from school as a result of student strikes and forced to continue his studies at home. In the same year, he sat for matriculation examinations at St. John's High School, Amtata. 
In the ensuing years, he completed a level examinations, the same tests undertaken in schools in England in Johannesburg, and undertook an economics degree as an external student with the University of London. During this time, the ANC was outlawed and Embiki was involved in underground activities in the Pretoria Witwatersrand Strand, now Gauteng area. He was also involved in mobilizing students in support of the ANC call for a stay at home to be held in protest of South Africa becoming a republic. He also holds a master's degree in economics from Sussex University. He was the first black South African to obtain a distinction in economics. In December 1961, Mbiki was elected secretary of the African Students Association. In the following year, he left South Africa on instructions of the ANC. Pavan Mbiki had come to the rural Eastern Cape as a political activist after earning two university degrees. He urged his family to make the ANC their family and of his children. Thabo Mbiki is the one who most clearly followed that instruction, joining the party at the age of 14 and devoting his life to it thereafter. Marriage and Family Mbiki, aged 16, had a child with Olive Impalwa named Manwabais Kwanda. Manwabais Kwanda disappeared in 1981 with Thabo's youngest brother Jama. On 23 November 1974, Mbiki married Zainal Ni Dilamini at Farnham Castle in the United Kingdom. They have no children. Exile and Return Going into Exile after the banning of the ANC, the organization decided it would be better for Mbiki to go into exile. In 1962, Mbiki and a group of comrades left South Africa disguised as a football team. They traveled in a minibus to Botswana and flew from there to Tanzania, where Mbiki accompanied Kenneth Konda, who later became Zambia's post-independence president, to London. Mbiki stayed with Oliver Tambo, who would later be elected the longest-serving president of the ANC in the absence of the jailed Ravonia trialists. Mbiki worked part-time with Tambo and Yusuf Dadu while studying economics at Sussex University in the coastal town of Brighton. At one stage, Mbiki shared a flat with two other students, Mike Yates and Derek Gunby. Together the trio would become firm friends and frequent a local bar when they were not discussing politics and listening to music. It was here that Mbiki developed a deep love for Brecht and Shakespeare and an appreciation of Yeats. He also came to love the blues. In February 1963, three months after his arrival at the university, Mbiki was elected onto the Student Union Committee. By April, he was one of 28 signatories petitioning in support of Spies for Peace, a document that revealed secret information about Britain's plans for civil defense and government in the event of a nuclear attack. On 11 July 1963, the high command of the ANC was caught at Lillisleaf Farm in Ravonia, one of them being Gavin Mbiki. To hold the prisoners, the General Laws Amendment Act, Number 37 of 1963 was rushed through Parliament and applied retrospectively to 27 June 1962, mainly but not exclusively so that the people arrested at Ravonia could be detained and held in solitary confinement. In July of the same year, Mbiki began mobilizing international support against apartheid. Horrified at the act, Mbiki led a successful motion in the student union to condemn the move and join the boycott of South African goods. He strongly condemned the South African government's new restrictions on political activity and likened it to in the politics of Nazi Germany. In April 1964, Mbiki appeared before a delegation of the United Nations Special Committee Against Apartheid to plead for the life of his father, who by then had been charged with planning an armed uprising against the state. The death penalty seemed a certainty for all the Ravonia treason trialists. This was the first time Mbiki had spoken about his father from the perspective of a son, 
but the biological category was converted into a political context. On 6 October, the Rivonia trialists were formally charged. On 13 June 1964, Embiki organized a march from Brighton to London, after the Rivonia trialists were found guilty of high treason. They were expected to be sentenced to death. The students held a night march to 10 Downing Street and handed a petition, signed by 664 staff and students at Sussex University, to the Prime Minister. Thereafter, they held a demonstration outside South Africa House in Trafalgar Square. The next day, London television showed Embiki leading the march. This kind of lobbying helped the trialists, who were spared the hangman's noose. For the next three decades, Embiki would take up the job of rallying support against apartheid. Embiki completed his bachelor's degree in economics at Sussex University in May 1965. With his own parents unable to attend his graduation ceremony, Adelaide Tambo and Michael Harmel took their place at the event. While in London, Embiki spent all of his summers with the Tambo family. After completing his first degree, Embiki planned to join UM Kanto We Sizwi MK and he sought permission to do so, but this plan was vetoed by Tambo, who advised him to do a master's degree. In October 1965, Embiki returned to Sussex for one year to do his master's in economics and development. Embiki at this time shared a flat with Peter Lawrence and Ingram, situated at 3 Silwood Street. While in England, Embiki supported the Labour Party, then led by Harold Wilson. Embiki was intensely critical of the new left revision of Marxism that swept Europe in the latter half of the 1960s and remained ardently loyal to the Soviet Union, which at the time heavily sponsored the ANC underground movement, providing them with financial and educational support, as well as arms and military training. On 18 May 1966, Embiki organized a 24-hour vigil at the clock tower in Brighton's Central Square against Ian Smith's unilateral declaration of independence in Rhodesia. In October 1966, Embiki moved to London to work for the ANC full-time. During this period, he met his wife-to-be, Zainal de Lamini, a social worker, from Alexandra Township in Johannesburg, who was also studying in London. Zainal had just moved to London at this time. In 1966, Embiki appealed to Oliver Tambo to allow any South African student who supported the ANC to be admitted into the movement's youth and students' section YSS, irrespective of race. Tambo agreed, and the YSS became the first non-racial arm of the ANC. In the same year, the ANC upheld its decision to exclude non-Africans from its national executive meeting in its Morogoro Conference. Mbiki busied himself with issues such as the protest against increases in student fees for foreign students, nuclear disarmament, and solidarity struggles with the peoples of Zimbabwe, Spain, Cyprus, Iraq, Iran and Vietnam, and the Portuguese-controlled territories. The YSS took an active role in the anti-Vietnam War movement, a campaign spearheaded by Embiki. This led to Embiki's friend, Esip Pahad, being elected onto the organizing committee of the Vietnam Solidarity Campaign VSC. The YSS became a major player in the anti-war marches. On 17 March 1968, Embiki took part in a massive anti-Vietnam demonstration outside the American Embassy in London's Grosvenor Square and had his upper right molar tooth cracked when he was attacked by a policeman. Although he was arraigned and arrested for his part in the demonstration, he was not one of the 246 that were eventually charged. Embiki completed his master's degree at Sussex University in May 1968. Moscow. Embiki was finally given permission to undergo a year of military training at the Lenin International School in Moscow. 
He arrived in Moscow in February 1969 and became a student at the Lenin Institute, which was established exclusively for communists, the exception being non-communist members of liberation movements who could get ideological training at the Institute. Mbiki excelled at the Institute and regularly addressed the Institute's weekly assembly. While in Moscow, he continued writing articles, documents and speeches for the ANC and its organs. In June 1969, Mbiki was chosen to be secretary of a high-level SAC delegation to the International Conference of Communist and Workers' Parties in Moscow. In June 1970, Mbiki was secretly shuttled from his military camp northwest of Moscow to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union Sisu Guest House in Volonskoy, where the South African Communist Party's SACT's Central Committee was holding its meeting. This was indeed significant because, to this point, the SACT leadership had been largely non-African. Mbiki and several Africans were now included in the committee, including Chris Haney. Both Haney and Mbiki celebrated their 28th birthdays at this meeting, making them the youngest members to ever serve on the committee. While in Moscow, Mbiki was trained in advanced guerrilla warfare at Escadnia, and although he was more comfortable with a book rather than a gun, the training was considered a necessary requirement if he was to be accepted as a leader. His military training was cut short as he was sent back to London to prepare for a new post in Lusaka. Throughout Mbiki's training, he kept in constant contact with Zainal, Lusaka and Botswana. Together with Oliver Tambo, Mbiki left London for Lusaka in April 1971 take up the position of Assistant Secretary of the ANC Revolutionary Council, RC. This was the first time in nine years that Mbiki was setting foot on African soil. The aim of the RC at this time was to bridge an ever-widening gap between the ANC in exile and the people back home. In Lusaka, Mbiki was housed in a secret location in Makeney, southwest of the city. Later, Mbiki moved over to work in the ANC propaganda section, but he continued to attend RC meetings. Four months after his arrival in Lusaka, Mbiki traveled to Baiklingen to deliver a speech on behalf of the ANC Executive Committee at the YSS Summer School. This was a turning point in Mbiki's life as it was the first time he spoke on behalf of the ANC as opposed to the ANC Youth League. In December 1972, Mbiki joined Tambo at Heathrow Airport to meet Mangasuthu Buffalesi to discuss mass resistance to apartheid. Mbiki is credited with facilitating the establishment of Inkatha. It was his responsibility to nurture the relationship between Buffalesi and the ANC. Mbiki was deployed to Botswana in 1973 to facilitate the development of an internal underground. Mbiki's life took a significant turn on 23 November 1974 when he married Zainal Dilamini. The wedding ceremony took place at Farnham Castle, the residence of Zainal's sister Edith and her husband, Wilfred Grenville Gray. Adelaide Tambo and Mendy Msamang stood in loco parentis for Mbiki while Esap Pahad was Mbiki's best man. The wedding, according to ANC rules, had to be approved by the organization a rule that applied to all permanently deployed members of the ANC, Swaziland and Nigeria. In January 1975, just a few months after his marriage to Zainal, Mbiki was sent to Swaziland to assess the possibility of setting up an ANC frontline base in the country. Ostensibly attending a UN conference, Mbiki was accompanied by Max Sisulu. The duo met with Sisulu's sister, Lindu Sisulu, who was studying at the university at Swaziland. Lindu set up a meeting for the two at the home of Esbu and Debel, then a librarian at the university. Mbiki and Sisulu held meetings in Swaziland for a week with South Africans studying there to assess the situation. They returned to Lusaka after a week, when their visas had expired. 
and the key reported back to the ANC that the possibility of establishing an ANC base in Swaziland was promising, especially because of its location, as it was close to Johannesburg and Durban. As a result, Mbiki was sent back to Swaziland to recruit soldiers for the organization's military wing. In Swaziland, Mbiki recruited hundreds of people into the ANC. He also liaised with Buffalesi and the latter's newly formed Inkatha movement and set up structures within South Africa. Mbiki's aim was to establish contact with as many Black Consciousness Movement BCM members as he could and to draw them into the ANC. Ironically, while Mbiki was converting BC adherents into ANC members, he would himself absorb many aspects of BC ideology. In March 1976, Mbiki, Albert Dlomo and Jacob Zuma were arrested in Swaziland, but the trio managed to escape deportation to South Africa. Instead, a month after their arrest, they were escorted across the border to Mozambique. From there, Mbiki went back to Lusaka for a few months before being posted to Nigeria in January 1977. Before leaving Lusaka, Mbiki was appointed as deputy to Duma Nakwi in the Department of Information and Propaganda DIP. Mbiki's mission in Nigeria was to establish diplomatic relations with Olusegun Obasanjo's regime, a mission that proved to be quite successful as Mbiki was to build a lasting relationship with the Nigerian authorities, eclipsing the Pan-Africanist Congress PAC in Nigeria. Zainal, who was running the Africa offices of the International University Education Fund in Lusaka, spent much of 1977 with her husband in Nigeria. In 1978, Mbiki became political secretary in the office of Oliver Tambo. He became a close confidant of Tambo, advising him on all matters and writing many of his speeches. One of his duties as secretary was to choose a theme each year in accordance with the ANC Current Activities 1979, for example, was known as the Year of the Spear, while 1980 was the Year of the Charter. From 1979, with Mbiki as his right-hand man, Tambo began building up the Gerala movement into an internationally recognized guardian of South African freedom, Zimbabwe. Mbiki was sent to Salisbury, renamed to Harare in 1980, immediately after Robert Mugabe took office as Prime Minister of Zimbabwe in 1980. On 11 August 1980, Tambo and Mbiki met with Mugabe and his advisor, Emerson Mnangagwa, in Salisbury. The meeting resulted in MK being allowed to move ammunition and cotters through Zimbabwe. Mugabe guaranteed that his government would assist ANC cooperatives in Zimbabwe. Mbiki, preferring to return to Lusaka, decided to hand over the reins in Zimbabwe to Chris Haney, who was to continue the relationship with Mugabe. In July 1981, Joe G. Kabai, the ANC representative in Zimbabwe, was assassinated at his home. The relationship between the ANC and the Zimbabwean government came under strain. During the 1980s, Mbiki became a leading figure in the SAC, rising to the party's central committee by the mid-1980s. The SAC was a vital part of the ANC alliance. In February 1982, Mbiki's brother Jama disappeared. He was later presumed dead. In 1985, PW Botha declared a state of emergency and gave the army and police special powers. In 1986, the South African army sent a captain in the South African Defense Force SADF to kill Mbiki. The plan was to put a bomb in his house in Lusaka, but the assassin was arrested by the Zambian police before he could go through with the plan. In 1985, Mbiki became the ANC director of the Department of Information and Publicity and coordinated diplomatic campaigns to involve more white South Africans in anti-apartheid activities. In 1989, 
He rose in the ranks to head the ANC Department of International Affairs and was involved in the ANC negotiations with the South African government. Mbiki played a major role in turning the international media against apartheid. Raising the diplomatic profile of the ANC, Mbiki acted as a point of contact for foreign governments and international organizations, and he was extremely successful in this position. Mbiki also played the role of ambassador to the steady flow of delegates from the elite sectors of white South Africa. These included academics, clerics, business people, and representatives of liberal white groups who traveled to Lusaka to assess the ANC views on a democratic, free South Africa. Mbiki was seen as pragmatic, eloquent, rational, and urbane. He was known for his diplomatic style and sophistication. In the early 1980s, Mbiki Jacob Zuma and Aziz Pahad were appointed by Tambo to conduct private talks with representatives of the National Party government. Twelve meetings between the parties took place between November 1987 and May 1990, most of them held at Mel's Park House, a country house near Bath in Somerset, England. By September 1989, the team secretly met with Maritz Sparwater and Mike Lau in a hotel in Switzerland. Known as Operation Flair, P.W. Botha was kept informed of all the meetings. At the same time, Mandela and Kobe Coetzee, the Minister of Justice, were also holding secret talks. In 1989, Botha suffered a stroke and was replaced by F.W. de Klerk who announced on 2 February 1990 that the ANC, SAC, PAC and other liberation movements were to be unbanned. This was a dramatic step, even for the National Party, but it was the pragmatic and moderate attitude of Mandela and Mbiki that played a crucial role in paving the way forward. Both of them reassured the National Party that the mass black constituency would accept the idea of negotiations. A new constitutional order was in the offing. As a sign of goodwill, de Klerk set free a few of the ANC top leadership at the end of 1989, among them Gavan Mbiki. Between 1990 and 1994, the ANC began preparing for the first democratic elections. It was an adjustment period and Mbiki played a crucial role in transforming the ANC into a legal political organization. In 1991, the ANC was able to hold its first legal conference in the country after 30 years of being banned. The party now had the task of finding a middle ground for discussion between all the various factions, the returning exiles, the long-term prisoners, and those who had stayed behind to lead the struggle. Mbiki was chosen as national chair while Cyril Ramaphosa was elected secretary general and the ANC chief negotiator at the multi-party talks. Mbiki had up to this point been handling much of the diplomatic talks with the apartheid regime, and given his diplomatic experience and the level of bargaining that was expected, it came as a surprise that Mbiki was sidelined in favor of Ramaphosa. Mbiki was now in a contest to become Mandela's deputy. His rivals were Ramaphosa and Chris Haney, Secretary General of the SAC. However, Mbiki had a strong support base among the ANC Youth League and the ANC Women's League. When Chris Haney was assassinated in 1993, Mbiki and Ramaphosa were left to contest the position of deputy president. After leaving the Eastern Cape, Thabo Mbiki lived in Johannesburg, working with Walter Sisulu. After the arrest and imprisonment of Sisulu, Mandela and his father, and facing a similar fate, he left South Africa as one of a number of young ANC militants, Amkanto Wisiswi Cotters, sent abroad to continue their education and their anti apartheid activities. He ultimately spent 28 years in exile returning to his homeland only after the release of Nelson Mandela. Mbiki spent the early years of his exile in the United Kingdom. In 1962, 
Aged 19, he arrived at the brand new University of Sussex, earning first a BA degree in economics, and then remaining to complete a master's degree in African studies. While at Sussex, he saw himself as a representative of the ANC and helped motivate the university population against apartheid. Still in the UK, he worked in the ANC London office on Penton Street. He received military training in the Soviet Union and lived at different times in Botswana, Swaziland and Nigeria, but his primary base was in Lusaka, Zambia, the site of the ANC headquarters. In 1973, Mbiki was sent to Botswana, where he engaged the Botswana government in discussions to open an ANC office there. He left Botswana in 1974. In 1975, he became a member of the National Executive Committee of the ANC. In December 1976, he was sent to Nigeria as a representative of the ANC. While in exile, his brother Jama Mbiki, a supporter of the rival Pan-Africanist Congress, was killed by agents of the Lesotho government in 1982 while attempting to assist the Lesotho Liberation Army. His son Kwanda, the product of a liaison in Mbiki's teenage years, was killed while trying to leave South Africa to join his father. And Mbiki finally was able to return home to South Africa and was reunited with his own father. The elder Mbiki told a reporter, You must remember that Thabo Mbiki is no longer my son. He is my comrade. A news article pointed out that this was an expression of pride, explaining for Gavan Mbiki, a son was a mere biological appendage. To be called a comrade, on the other hand, was the highest honor. Mbiki devoted his life to the ANC, and during his years in exile was given increased responsibility. Following the 1976 Soweto riots, a student uprising in the township outside Johannesburg, he initiated a regular radio broadcast from Lusaka, tying ANC followers inside the country to their exiled leaders. Encouraging activists to keep up the pressure on the apartheid regime was a key component in the ANC campaign to liberate their country. In the late 1970s, Mbiki made a number of trips to the United States in search of support among U.S. corporations. Literate and funny, he made a wide circle of friends in New York City. Mbiki was appointed head of the ANC Information Department in 1984 and then became head of the International Department in 1989, reporting directly to Oliver Tambo, then president of the ANC. Tambo was Mbiki's longtime mentor. In 1985, Mbiki was a member of a delegation that began meeting secretly with representatives of the South African business community, and in 1989, he led the ANC delegation that conducted secret talks with the South African government. These talks led to the unbanning of the ANC and the release of political prisoners. He also participated in many of the other important negotiations between the ANC and the government, that eventually led to the democratization of South Africa. He became a deputy president of South Africa in May 1994 on the attainment of universal suffrage right to vote and sole deputy president in June 1996. He succeeded Nelson Mandela as ANC president in December 1997 and as president of South Africa in June 1999 he was re-elected for a second term in April 2004. Role in African Politics Mbiki has been a powerful figure in African politics, positioning South Africa as a regional power broker and promoting the idea that African political conflicts should be solved by Africans. He headed the formation of both the New Partnership for Africa's Development NEPED and the African Union O oh, and has played influential roles in brokering peace deals in Rwanda, Rwanda, Ivory Coast, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. He has also tried to popularize 
the concept of an African Renaissance. He sees African dependence on aid and foreign intervention as a major barrier, and sees structures like NEPAD and the O as part of a process in which Africa solves its own problems without relying on outside assistance. Mbiki has sometimes been characterized as remote and academic, although in his second campaign for the presidency in 2004, many observers described him as finally relaxing into more traditional ways of campaigning, sometimes dancing at events and even kissing babies. Mbiki used his weekly column in the ANC newsletter ANC Today to produce discussions on a variety of topics. He sometimes used his column to deliver pointed invective against political opponents, and at other times used it, a kind of professor of political theory, educating ANC Cotters on the intellectual justifications for African National Congress policy. Although these columns were remarkable for their dense prose, they often were used to influence news. Although Mbiki did not generally make a point of befriending or courting reporters, his columns and news events often yielded good results for his administration by ensuring that his message is a primary driving force of news coverage. Indeed, in initiating his columns, Mbiki stated his view that the bulk of South African media sources did not speak for or to the South African majority, and stated his intent to use ANC Today to speak directly to his constituents rather than through the media. Economic Policies The CIA World Factbook says, South African economic policy is fiscally conservative, but pragmatic, focusing on targeting inflation and liberalizing trade as means to increase job growth and household income. Mbiki, as an ANC insider and while president, was a major force behind the continued neoliberal structure of the South African economy. He drew criticism from the left for his perceived abandonment of state interventionist social democratic economic policies, such as nationalization, land reform, and democratic capital controls, prescribed by the Freedom Charter, the ANC seminal document. Mbiki and the Internet Mbiki appears to have been at ease with the Internet and willing to quote from it. For instance, in a column discussing Hurricane Katrina, he cited Wikipedia quoted at length a discussion of Katrina's lessons on American inequality from the Native American publication Indian Country Today, and then included excerpts from a David Brooks column in the New York Times in a discussion of why the events of Katrina illustrated the necessity for global development and redistribution of wealth is penchant for quoting diverse and sometimes obscure sources, both from the Internet and from a wide variety of books, made his column an interesting parallel to political blogs, although the ANC does not describe it in these terms. His views on AIDS, see below, were supported by Internet searching which led him to so-called AIDS denialist websites in this case, and Mbiki's use of the Internet was roundly criticized, and even ridiculed by opponents. Global Apartheid Mbiki has used his position on the world stage to call for an end to global apartheid, a term he uses to describe the disparity between a small minority of rich nations and a great number of impoverished states in the world, arguing that a global human society based on poverty for many and prosperity for a few, characterized by islands of wealth, surrounded by a sea of poverty, is unsustainable. Controversies Zimbabwe South Africa's proximity, strong trade links, and similar struggle credentials placed South Africa in a unique position to influence politics in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe's hyperinflation since 2000 was a matter of increasing concern to Britain as the former colonial power and other donors to that country. High-ranking diplomatic visits to South Africa repeatedly attempted to persuade Mbiki to take a harder line with Robert Mugabe over violent state-sponsored attacks on political opponents and opposition movements, 
expropriation of white-owned farms by ZANU PF allied war veterans, sanctioning against the press, and infringements on the independence of the judiciary. Rather than publicly criticizing Mugabe's government, Mbiki chose quiet diplomacy over megaphone diplomacy his term for the West's increasingly forthright condemnation of Mugabe's rule. Mbiki is even quoted claiming there is no crisis in Zimbabwe, despite increased evidence of political violence and murders, hyperinflation, and the influx of political refugees into South Africa. To quote Mbiki, the point really about all this from our perspective has been that the critical role we should play is to assist the Zimbabweans, to find each other, really to agree among themselves about the political, economic, social, other solutions that their country needs. We could have stepped aside from that task and then shouted, and that would be the end of our contribution. They would shout back at us and that would be the end of the story. I'm actually the only head of government that I know anywhere in the world who has actually gone to Zimbabwe and spoken publicly very critically of the things that they are doing. 2002 Presidential Elections Mugabe faced a critical presidential election in 2002. Concerns over the conduct of the election in Zimbabwe prompted debate within the Commonwealth and led to a difficult decision to suspend Zimbabwe from the organization. Mbiki supported Mugabe during this period. It is thought that Mbiki viewed Mugabe as a victim of imperialist meddling and the opposition movement for democratic change in D.C. as a Western stooge. The full meeting of the Commonwealth had failed in a consensus to decide on the issue, and they tasked the previous, present at the time, and future leaders of Commonwealth respectively President Alusagun Obasanjo of Nigeria, John Howard of Australia, and Mbiki of South Africa, to come to a consensus between them over the issue. On 20 March 2002, ten days after the elections, which Mugabe won, Howard announced that they had agreed to suspend Zimbabwe for a year. A 50-person strong South African observer mission found that the outcome of the 2002 Zimbabwe presidential elections should be considered legitimate despite condemnations over the conduct of the election by the Commonwealth. Mbiki also sent South African judges Sisi Kampek and Dikang Mosnek to observe and compile a report on the elections. The report was kept secret until 2014 when the Constitutional Court ordered that Kampek's report should be made public after a long court case brought against the South African government by the Mail and Guardian newspaper. The Compep report contradicted the South African Observer Mission and found that the election cannot be considered to be free and fair and documented 107 murders mostly committed against supporters of the opposition MDC by ZANU-PF militias in the weeks before the elections. Mbiki's stance on the elections permanently soured relations between South Africa and Zimbabwe's opposition and negatively affected the credibility of South African diplomacy. 2005 Parliamentary Elections In the face of laws restricting public assembly and freedom of the media, restricting campaigning by the MDC for the 2005 Zimbabwe parliamentary elections, President Mbiki was quoted as saying, I have no reason to think that anything will happen, that anybody in Zimbabwe will act in a way that will militate against the elections being free and fair. As far as I know, things like an independent electoral commission, access to the public media, the absence of violence and intimidation. Minerals and Energy Minister Fumzail Mlambo Njikuka led the largest foreign observer mission, the SAC Observer Mission, to oversee the Zimbabwe elections. Contrary to other international missions and parts of the SA Parliamentary Mission, the mission congratulated the people of Zimbabwe for holding a peaceful, credible, and well-mannered election which reflects the will of the people. The Democratic Alliance Delegation Part SA Parliamentary Observer Mission clashed with the minister and eventually submitted a separate report contradicting her findings. 
The elections were widely denounced and many accused ZANU PF of massive and often violent intimidation, using food to buy votes and large discrepancies in the tallying of votes. Dialogue between ZANU PF and MDC. Mbiki attempted to restore dialogue between Zimbabwean President Robert Mugabe and the opposition movement for democratic change in the face of denials from both parties. A fact-finding mission in 2004 by Congress of South African trade unions to Zimbabwe led to their widely publicized deportation back to South Africa, which reopened the debate, even within the ANC, as to whether Mbiki's policy of quiet diplomacy was constructive. On 5 February 2006, Mbiki said in an interview with SAB Television that Zimbabwe had missed a chance to resolve its political crisis in 2004 when secret talks to agree on a new constitution ended in failure. He claimed that he saw a copy of a new constitution signed by all parties. The job of promoting dialogue between the ruling party and the opposition was likely made more difficult by divisions within the MDC. In turn, the MDC unanimously rejected this assertion. MDC Mutambara Faction's Secretary General Welshman in Cube said we never gave Mbiki a draft constitution unless it was ZANU PF which did that. Mbiki has to tell the world what he was really talking about. In May 2007, it was reported that Mbiki had been partisan and taken sides with ZANU PF in his role as mediator. He had given preconditions to the opposition movement for democratic change before the dialogue could resume while giving no conditions to the ZANU PF government. He required that the MDC accept and recognize Robert Mugabe was the president of Zimbabwe, and the MDC accept the 2002 presidential election results despite widespread belief of being unfree, unfair, and fraudulent. Business Response On 10 January 2006, businessman Warren Clulo, on the board of four of the top ten listed companies in SA, including Old Mutual, Sassol, Nedbank, and Barlowworld. Clulo's sentiments reflected the South African private sector's increasing impatience with Mbiki's quiet diplomacy and were echoed by business unity South Africa BUSA, the umbrella body for business organizations in South Africa. As the company's chairman, he said in Barlowworld's latest annual report, SA efforts to date were fruitless, and that the only means for a solution was for SA to lead from the front. Our role and responsibility is not just to promote discussion. Our aim must be to achieve meaningful and sustainable change. Position on Mugabe Mbiki was frequently criticized for not exerting pressure on Mugabe to relinquish power, although he chaired meetings in which the Zimbabwean leader's potential departure from power was negotiated. He rejected calls in May 2007 for tough action against Zimbabwe ahead of a visit by British Prime Minister Tony Blair. He said on 29 July 2007 that Zimbabwe elections in March 2008 must be free and fair. An article critical of Mbiki's handling of Mugabe appeared in Forbes and claimed a peaceful transfer of power in Zimbabwe will not be because of Mbiki but in spite of him. Abraham Fakir, a researcher at the Johannesburg-based Center for Policy Studies, and Susan Buysen, political analyst at the University of the Witwatersrand. The media has been very critical. The Washington Post published a commentary describing Mbiki as a bankrupt Democrat and accused him of complicity in stealing the Zimbabwean election while The Economist called Mbiki's actions unconscionable. Said facilitator of Zimbabwe Power Sharing Agreement. At the end of the fourth day of negotiations, South African President and Mediator to Zimbabwe Thabo Mbiki announced in Harare that Robert Mugabe of ZANU-PF, Professor Arthur Mutambara of MDCM, and Morgan T. Svangarai of MDCT finally signed the Power Sharing Agreement Memorandum of Understanding. Mbiki stated, 
An agreement has been reached on all items on the agenda. All of them, you gave. Tis Bangarai, Mutambara endorsed the document tonight and signed it. The formal signing will be done on Monday, 10 a.m. The document will be released then. The ceremony will be attended by the SAC and other African regional and continental leaders. The leaders will spend the next few days constituting the inclusive government to be announced on Monday. The leaders will work very hard to mobilize support for the people to recover. We hope the world will assist so that this political agreement succeeds. In the signed historic power deal, Mugabe, on 11 September 2008, agreed to surrender day-to-day -day control of the government, and the deal was also expected to result in a de facto amnesty for the military and ZANU-PF party leaders. Opposition sources said that T. Svangarai will become prime minister at the head of a council of ministers, the principal organ of government, drawn from his party and the president's ZANU-PF party, and Mugabe will remain president and continue to chair a cabinet that will be a largely consultative body, and the real power will lie with T. Svangarai. South Africa's Business Day reported, however, that Mugabe was refusing to sign a deal which would curtail his presidential powers. Nelson Chamisa, a spokesman for the MDCT, announced that this is an inclusive government and that the executive power would be shared by the president, the prime minister, and the cabinet. According to the New York Times, Mugabe T. Svangarai and Arthur Mutambara had still not decided how to divide the ministries, and Jende E. Fraser, the American Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs, said, We don't know what's on the table, and it's hard to rally for an agreement when no one knows the details or even the broad outlines. On 15 September 2008, the leaders of the 14-member Southern African Development Community witnessed the signing of the power-sharing agreement brokered by Mbiki. With a symbolic handshake and warm smiles at the Rainbow Towers Hotel in Harare, Mugabe and T. Svangarai signed the deal to end the violent political crisis. Mugabe was to remain president, Morgan T. Svangarai was to become prime minister, the MDC was to control the police, Mugabe's ZANU-PF was to command the army, and Arthur Mutambara was to deputy prime minister. AIDS Mbiki's views on the causes of AIDS, and in particular the link between HIV and AIDS, and the treatment of AIDS have been widely criticized. In 1995, the International Conference for People Living with HIV and AIDS was held in South Africa, the first time that the annual conference had been held in Africa. At the time, Mbiki was deputy president and, in his official capacity, acknowledged the seriousness of the epidemic. The South African Ministry of Health announced that some 850,000 people, too, 1% of the total population were believed to be HIV positive. In 2000, the Department of Health outlined a five-year plan to combat AIDS, HIV, and sexually transmitted infections. A National AIDS Council was established to oversee the implementation of the plan. However, after becoming president, Mbiki changed tack and represented the views of a small minority of eminent scientists who claimed that AIDS was not caused by HIV. These included Nobel Prize winner Kerry Mullies, the U.S. and National Academy of Sciences member Peter Duisberg, as well as others with varying degrees of prominence. Mbiki found their views compelling, although the overwhelming majority of scientists disagree with them. On 9 July 2000, at the International AIDS Conference in Durban, President Mbiki made a speech that attracted much criticism in that he avoided references to HIV and instead focused mainly on poverty as a powerful cofactor in AIDS diagnosis. His administration was repeatedly accused of failing to respond adequately to the AIDS epidemic and including failing to authorize and implement an overall national treatment program for AIDS 
that included antiretroviral medicines, and in particular an antiretroviral program to prevent HIV transmission from pregnant mothers to babies while in the womb. Mvk's government did, however, introduce a law allowing cheaper locally produced generic medicines, and in April 2001 succeeded in defending a legal action brought by transnational pharmaceutical companies to set aside the law. AIDS activists, particularly the Treatment Action Campaign and its allies, thought that the law was intended to support a cheap antiretroviral drugs program and applauded Mbiki's government. However, the Treatment Action Campaign and its allies were eventually forced to resort to the South African courts, which in 2002 ordered the government make the drug nevirapine available to pregnant women to help prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Notwithstanding and despite international drug companies offering free or cheap antiretroviral drugs, until 2003, South Africans with HIV who used the public sector health system could only get treatment for opportunistic infections they suffered because of their weakened immune systems, but could not get antiretrovirals designed to specifically target HIV. In November 2003, the government finally approved a plan to make antiretroviral treatment publicly available. It appears that this was only after the cabinet had overruled the president. In November 2008, the New York Times reported that due to Thabo Mbiki's rejection of scientific consensus on AIDS and his embrace of AIDS denialism, an estimated 365,000 people had perished in South Africa. A study in African Affairs in 2008 found that Mbiki's government could have prevented the deaths of 343,000 South Africans during his tenure had it followed the more sensible public health policies then applied in the Western Cape province. Mbiki and the Cabinet The South African Constitution allows the Cabinet to override the President. The secret ballot appears to have gone against the President when Cabinet policy declared that HIV is the cause of AIDS. Again, in August 2003, Cabinet promised to formulate a national treatment plan that would include ARV. At the time, the Health Ministry was still headed by Dr. Manto Tishabalala M. Samang, who had served as Health Minister since June 1999, and was promoting approaches to AIDS such as a diet of African potatoes and garlic, while highlighting the toxicities of antiretroviral drugs. This led critics to question whether the same leadership that opposed ARV treatment would effectively carry out the treatment plan. Implementation was slow requiring a court judgment to eventually force government to distribute ARV. Delivery was further improved when Thabo Mbiki was ousted. Dr. Manto T. Shavalala M. Samang redeployed as the Minister of the Presidency and Barbara Hogan deployed to Minister of Health. AIDS Denialist Connections After he assumed the presidency, he appears to have articulated more clearly his understanding that poverty is a significant factor in the prevalence of AIDS and other health problems. He urged political attention be directed to addressing poverty generally rather than only against AIDS specifically. Some speculate that the suspicion engendered by a life in exile and by the colonial domination and control of Africa led Mbiki to react against a portrayal of AIDS as another Western characterization of Africans as promiscuous and Africa as a continent of disease and hopelessness. For example, speaking to a group of university students in 2001, he struck out against what he viewed as the racism underlying how many in the West characterized AIDS in Africa. Convinced that we are but natural-born, promiscuous carriers of germs unique in the world, they proclaim that our continent is doomed to an inevitable mortal end because of our unconquerable devotion to the sin of lust. ANC rules and Embiki's commitment to the idea of party discipline mean that he may not publicly criticize the current government policy, 
that HIV causes AIDS and that antiretrovirals should be provided. Some critics of Mbiki continued to assert that notwithstanding he continued to influence AIDS policy through his personal views behind the scenes, a charge which his office regularly denies. However, in a 2007 published biography Thabo Mbiki, The Dream Deferred, author Mark Jeviser describes how the president, knowing that he was writing the biography, contacted him earlier in 2007. This was to ask whether the author had seen a 100-page paper secretly authored by Mr. Embiki and distributed anonymously among the ANC leadership six years ago. This paper compared Orthodox AIDS scientists to latter-day Nazi concentration camp doctors and portrayed black people who accepted Orthodox AIDS science as self-repressed victims of a slave mentality. It described the HIV-slash-AIDS thesis as entrenched in centuries-old white racist beliefs and concepts about Africans. In the published biography, Mr. Jeviser describes the president's view of the disease as apparently shaped by an obsession with race, the legacy of colonialism, and sexual shame. Since release of the biography, President Mbiki's defenders have tried hard to clarify his position as being an AIDS dissident as opposed to an AIDS denier. That is, he accepts that HIV causes AIDS, but is a dissident in that he is at odds with prevailing AIDS-focused public health policies, stating that it is only one of many immune deficiency diseases, many of which are associated with poverty, and that political attention and resources should be directed to poverty and immune deficiency diseases generally rather than AIDS specifically. Electricity Crisis In January 2008, the South African government announced it would introduce electricity rationing. On 25 January 2008, the country's deepening power crisis was such that South Africa's and the world's largest gold and platinum mining companies were forced to shut down operations. Eskom, the national power supplier, and the government both apologized for the blackouts, and in his next-to-last State of the Nation speech, Mbiki devoted nearly three pages to the electricity crisis, repeating the apologies of Eskom and the government. Mbiki blamed the power shortages on increased demand caused by years of economic growth and the provision of electricity to black townships that were not connected in the apartheid era. But Mbiki also admitted the government had failed to heed warnings from Eskom the earliest ten years previously that without new power stations Eskom might not be able to meet demand by 2007. Each year over the preceding ten years, Eskom had produced annual integrated strategic electricity plans, each setting out scenarios of future investment requirements to cope with projected increased demand. Mbiki failed to respond to allegations that the government's black empowerment strategy had been a root cause of the problem in that small and medium-sized black entrepreneurs, in preference to large corporations, had been awarded coal supply tenders. The policy of giving preference to small suppliers had caused problems in securing reliable supplies of coal, and had also, because small suppliers did not have the capital to invest in rail or conveyor belts infrastructure but used coal trucks, accelerated the wear and tear damage to the roads around the power stations. Warnings highlighted in several of Eskom's annual reports, starting in 2003, had been ignored not only by the Eskom board, but also its political masters, Mbiki's government. The power problems were further exacerbated by Mbiki's government policy of attracting energy-intensive industry such as aluminium smelters through the carrot of cheap electricity. This meant that, as Eskom's excess capacity ran out and became a deficit, the South African government finds itself contractually bound to provide power to energy-intensive industries. Despite this meaning the rest of the country experienced traffic problems and business disruption due to the blackouts. For South Africa to remain a desirable foreign investment destination, 
the country must be seen to honor its contractual obligations. To shut down the smelters is not a simple process, said one analyst. Government would be paying the cost of effects all through the relevant parties' aluminium value chain its aluminium refineries and bauxite or mines in other countries. Crime In 2004, President Thabo Mbeki made an attack on commentators who argued that violent crime was out of control in South Africa, calling them white racists who want the country to fail. He alleged that crime was falling and some journalists were distorting reality by depicting black people as barbaric savages who liked to rape and kill. Annual statistics published in September 2004 showed that most categories of crime were down, but some had challenged the figure's credibility and said that South Africa remained extremely dangerous, especially for women. In a column for the African National Congress website, the president rebuked the doubters. Mr. Mbeki did not name journalist Charlene Smith, who had championed victims of sexual violence since writing about her own rape, but quoted a recent article in which she said South Africa had the highest rate of rape and referred apparently sarcastically to her as an internationally recognized expert on sexual violence. He said she was saying our cultures, traditions, and religions as Africans inherently make every African man a potential rapist, a view which defines the African people as barbaric savages. Mr. Mbeki also described the newspaper The Citizen and other commentators who challenged the apparent fall in crime as pessimists who did not trust black rule. In January 2007, the African peer review mechanism APM draft report on South Africa was released. This noted that South Africa had the world's second highest murder rate, with about 50 people a day being killed, and that although serious crime was reported as falling, security analysts said that the use of violence in robberies and rape were more common. Mbeki in response said in an interview that fears of crime were exaggerated. In December 2007, the final African peer review mechanism APM report on South Africa again suggested that there was an unacceptably high level of violent crime in the country. President Mbeki said the suggestion of unacceptably high violent crime appeared to be an acceptance by the panel of what he called a populist view. He challenged some of the statistics on crime, which he noted may have resulted from a weak information base, leading to wrong conclusions. Although rape statistics had been obtained from the South African Police Service, 2008 xenophobia attacks. In May 2008, a series of riots took place in a number of townships, mainly in Gauteng province, which left 42 dead several hundred injured, and several thousand displaced. The root cause of the riot was xenophobic attacks on foreigners, mainly Zimbabweans who had fled their country following the collapse of the Zimbabwean economy. The migrants were blamed for high levels of unemployment, housing shortages, and crime. Following the riots, Mbeki was criticized for ignoring the scale of the problem and failing to deal with the causes of it. The Zimbabwe Exiles Group accused him of being more concerned with appeasing Mr. Mugabe than recognizing the scale of the problem caused by the flood of Zimbabweans into South Africa. In response to the violence, President Mbeki announced he would set up a panel of experts to investigate the riots and authorized military force against rioters. This is the first time that such an authorization of military force was used by the government since the end of apartheid. Role in procuring the 2010 FIFA World Cup. It was Mbeki's vision and his African Renaissance attitude that had undoubtedly brought the successful bid to host the 2010 FIFA World Cup. Acknowledging Mbeki's contribution, Business Day newspaper in Johannesburg said in its editorial opinion, the fact is that it was the former president's vision of an African renaissance, with South Africa leading the charge to prove to the rest of the world 
that the continent was not destined to disappoint in perpetuity, that resulted in us persisting in our bid to host the tournament. Similarly, the same theme was mentioned by the Citizen newspaper in Johannesburg, saying now we know he was correct in that assessment of South Africa's ability to stage the greatest show on earth. Mbiki always believed that Africans are capable of hosting the World Cup. President Mbiki worked to bring the 2010 World Cup to the African continent for the first time. He personally asked favors to some world leaders to support his World Cup bid. Among these leaders is the then president of Brazil, Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva. Mbiki said, with your distinguished football record, the International Football Federation FIFA can hardly refuse if Brazil says the cup must go to South Africa. Debate with Archbishop Tutu in 2004, the Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town, Dismond Tutu, criticized President Mbiki for surrounding himself with yes-men, not doing enough to improve the position of the poor and for promoting economic policies that only benefited a small black elite. He also accused Mbiki and the ANC of suppressing public debate. Mbiki responded, that Tutu had never been an ANC member and defended the debates that took place within ANC branches and other public forums. He also asserted his belief in the value of democratic discussion by quoting the Chinese slogan Let a Hundred Flowers Bloom, referring to the Brief Hundred Flowers campaign within the Chinese Communist Party in 1956-57. The ANC Today newsletter featured several analyses of the debate, written by Mbiki and the ANC. The latter suggested that Tutu was an icon of white elites, thereby suggesting that his political importance was overblown by the media, and while the article took pains to say that Tutu had not sought this status, it was described in the press as a particularly pointed and personal critique of Tutu. Tutu responded that he would pray for Mbiki as he had prayed for the officials of the apartheid government. Mbiki, Zuma, and Succession In 2005, Mbiki removed Jacob Zuma from his post as deputy president of South Africa, after Zuma was implicated in a corruption scandal. In October 2005, in late 2005, there was visible split between Zuma's supporters and Mbiki's allies in the ANC. In February 2006, Mbiki told the SAC that he and the ANC had no intention to change the constitution of the country to permit him a third term in office. He stated, by the end of 2009, I will have been in a senior position in government for 15 years. I think that's too long. Mbiki, although barred by the Constitution of South Africa from seeking a third term as president of the country, in 2007 entered the race to be president of the ANC. No term limit exists for the position of ANC president for a third term, in a close battle with Jacob Zuma. He lost this vote against Jacob Zuma on 18 December 2007 at the ANC conference in Palakwain. Zuma went on to be the ANC presidential candidate in the 2009 general election. Appeal On 12 September 2008, Pieter Maritzburg High Court Judge Chris Nishalson ruled that Zuma's corruption charges were unlawful on procedural grounds, adding there was reason to believe the charges against Zuma had been politically motivated. Mbiki filed affidavit and applied to the Constitutional Court to appeal this ruling. It was improper for the court to make such far-reaching, vexatious, scandalous, and prejudicial findings concerning me to be judged and condemned on the basis of the findings in the Zuma matter. The interests of justice, in my respectful submission, would demand that the matter be rectified. These adverse findings have led to my being recalled by my political party, the ANC, a request I have acceded to as a committed and loyal member of the ANC for the past 52 years. I fear that if not rectified, I might suffer further prejudice. Tilali Tilali
National Prosecuting Authority spokesman, stated by phone from Pretoria on 23 September, we have received the papers. It's under consideration. Resignation. Note, unless otherwise specified, the terms President and Deputy President refer to roles in government, whereas ANC President or ANC Deputy President refer to roles in the ANC political party. Mbiki formally announced his resignation on 21 September 2008 at 19.30 South African time, 17.30 UTC, as a result of the ANC National Executive Committee's decision no longer to support him in Parliament. This came a few days after the dismissal of a trial against ANC President Jacob Zuma on charges of corruption due to procedural errors. Allusions were made in the ruling to possible political interference by Mbiki and others in his prosecution. Parliament convened on 22 September, accepted his resignation with effect from 25 September, however, because an MP for the Freedom Front Opposition Party declared his objection to the resignation, a debate was set to take place the following day. In cases of such a void in the presidency, the Constitution regulates the replacement to serve as the interim president, either the deputy president, the Speaker of Parliament, or any MP member of Parliament, as chosen by Parliament, can take the role of president of the country till the next election. ANC President Jacob Zuma, who was elected president after the next general election, was not eligible as he was at the time none of these. The current deputy president Fumzail and Lambo Njikuka was unlikely to be chosen either, apparently due to her close ties to Mbiki and because her husband. As a result, the Speaker of Parliament, Bailka Mbite, had been cited as the likely caretaker president, however, speaking on behalf of the ANC, Zuma strongly hinted at ANC deputy president K. Gailman Motland, who is an MP becoming Mbiki's replacement for the remainder of the current term of Parliament, which ended in early 2009. Although Zuma could put pressure on the government and his party to choose Motland, the replacement president had to be decided by Parliament. Deputy President Fumzail Mlambo Njikuka, Minister in the Presidency Esa Pahad and Minister of Science and Technology Mazabuti Mangina all announced their intentions of resigning. Nathai M. Fethwa, chief whip of the ruling African National Congress, ANC stated that Mbiki's resignation would take effect on 25 September 2008. ANC President Jacob Zuma said that his deputy, K. Gail Mamakland, would become acting president until 2009 general elections. I am convinced if given that responsibility, he Motland would be equal to the task. The ANC confirmed that K. Gailma Motland is to become caretaker president of the 2009 general election. The direction of Mbiki's vote in South Africa's 2009 general election was a matter of discussion among press and public alike. Although Mbiki had completely disassociated himself from party politics subsequent to his resignation, Many suggested that Congress of the People cope. On election day, 22 April, having done the deed, Mbiki announced that his vote was a secret and called on the electorate to exercise its democratic right not out of fear or historical loyalty, but for a future that it desired and a party that would further its ends. These sentiments were widely interpreted as pro-cope. It was noted, though, that Despite having been invited, Mbiki had failed to attend a COPE rally the week before. Recognition Honorary Degrees Mbiki has received many honorary degrees from South African and foreign universities. Mbiki received an honorary doctorate in business administration from the Arthur D. Little Institute, Boston, in 1994. In 1995, he received honorary doctorate from the University of South Africa and an honorary doctorate of laws from Sussex University. 
Mbiki was awarded an honorary doctorate from Rand Afrikaans University in 1999. In 2000, he was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws from Glasgow Caledonian University. In 2004, he was awarded an honorary doctorate in commercial sciences by the University of Stellenbosch. Orders and Decorations During Embiki's official visit to Britain in 2001, he was made an honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath GCB. The mayor of Athens, Dora Bakoyanis awarded Embiki with the City of Athens Medal of Honor in 2005. During Embiki's official visit to Sudan in 2005, he was awarded Sudan's insignia of honor in recognition of his role in resolving conflicts and working for development in the continent. In 2007, Embiki was made a Knight of the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital, of St. John of Jerusalem at St. George's Cathedral in Cape Town by the current Grand Prior. Awards Mbiki was awarded the Good Governance Award in 1997 by the U.S.-based Corporate Council on Africa. He received the Newsmaker of the Year Award from Pretoria News Press Association in 2000 and repeated the honor in 2008 in honor of his commitment to democracy in the new South Africa, Mbiki was awarded the Oliver Tambo slash Johnny Makatini Freedom Award in 2000. Mbiki was awarded the Peace and Reconciliation Award at the Gandhi Awards for Reconciliation in Durban in 2003. In 2004, Mbiki was awarded the Good Brother Award by Washington, D.C.S. National Congress of Black Women for his commitment to gender equality and the emancipation of women in South Africa. In 2005, he was also awarded the Champion of the Earth Award by the United Nations. During the European Wide Action Week against Racism in 2005, Mbiki was awarded the Rotterdam's Jongeren Rod RJR Anti-Discrimination Award by the Netherlands. In 2006, he was awarded the Presidential Award for his outstanding service to economic growth and investor confidence in South Africa and Africa, and for his role in the international arena by the South African Chambers of Commerce and Industry. In 2007, Mbiki was awarded the Confederation of African Football's Order of Merit for his contribution to football on the continent. Patronages Thabo Mbiki Foundation, Thabo Mbiki African Leadership Institute, an institute of the University of South Africa in partnership with the Thabo Mbiki Foundation, Thabo Mbiki Presidential Library, Foreign Honors, United Kingdom, Knight Grand Cross of the Order of the Bath 2007 United Kingdom, Honorary Knight Grand Cross of the Order of St. Michael and St. George 2000. Books and Biographies A Legacy of Liberation, Thabo Mbiki and the Future of the South African Dream by Mark Jeviser, 2009 Eight Days in September, The Removal of Thabo Mbiki by Frank Chicane, 2012